Okay, so I would like to go over the FRQ assessment uh, and put this out there in the hopes that some of you who are interested will get a chance to look at it tonight and perhaps use it for tomorrow. Now I'm going to go through the answers to the questions, but to be honest, the first things I'd like to say are probably the most important. So, um, because actually I'm not really sure how whether you all get a report back on how to correctly answer them or not, or whether you need this, but I'm going to ask a couple of you tomorrow. Um, in either case, a lot of what doing FRQ practice is about is about learning how to use the command terms and how to write answers that AP Central is looking for. It's in some ways part of what I like the least about the AP test, but it's also a critical skill to develop. So as far as tomorrow's assessment goes, I'm going to be much more lenient with my grading in the sense that I'm going to look for answers within what you write um, and look for ways for you to earn points in situations where, according to the AP board, you might not have earned points. So that being said, some of you are going to have very low scores on this FRQ. Please don't panic. I'm scoring you as if you were taking the AP test. Tomorrow's assessment is not the AP test. It's my evaluation of where you're at in your learning so far, not whether or not you're ready to take the AP test for Unit 1. I don't expect any of you to be there yet. We're going to continue working on Unit 1 all year, so you've got time to work on this stuff. Um, so, I scored it the way AP will score it, so that you can develop the skill while you're taking these FRQ tests. Um, the other thing is, I would like to, to note that some of you, I think, were using outside sources to kind of gather your information, which is fine. I told you you could do that, and you can do that tomorrow. Um, however, I, it, it, some of the answers looked like they might have just been copied and pasted. And I want you to know that I really appreciate those of you that tried, that would, most of you, that tried to generate your own answer the best you could. And know that there are some of you who scored, you know, eight out of eight that I don't necessarily think that that represents the likelihood that you're going to score similarly tomorrow. Likewise, I think there's some of you who scored two or three or four out of eight that I think are going to score much better on tomorrow's assessment. Um, so let's go through it. Um, the first scenario, we have these white blood cells. They're talking about how they're fusing them with B cancer cells to allow them to live longer, but the white blood cells um, are able to, um, to produce nitrogenous bases, um, whereas the cancer cells are not. It's a common technique in biology. Um, it allows you to allow cell cultures to keep growing while ensuring that you keep the uh, the strain that you want. So any cancer cells that somehow lost the genetic material for the white blood cells would also lose the ability to produce nitrogen and die. Um, it's a really interesting biological process, a way of testing some ideas. But that's not really what they ask you about. They start off by saying, describe the role of carbon in biological systems. And the correct answer, if you look over here on the right side of the screen, what they were looking for, the only thing they were looking for, is that carbon is used to build biological molecules such as carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. And that's in this answer here, right? There's in all four macromolecules, um, you know, the specific ones weren't mentioned, but he talks about the skeleton and so on. And so that earned a point. Um, uh, generally, people did pretty well on that question. Question B then asked um, if the membranes uh, fuse, what would happen of these two cells? And um, the response over here on the right shows you what AP was looking for. I was a little more lenient with this. Mostly what I wanted to see is that you talked about how the polar ends of the phospholipid will align with other polar ends of the phospholipids of the cell membrane of the cancer cell. And that the hydrophobic uh, nonpolar parts of the phospholipids would also align and interact. Um, so here, the reason I didn't give this credit, it says when the membrane fuses, the polar parts will combine to form a connected B cell that because of the mutation of the cancer is able to survive. Da, 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 da. 
it's not that this isn't true, it just doesn't directly answer the question. So make sure you're carefully reading the questions as you answer them. Um, in this case, all they wanted to know was what was going to happen to the, the polar and nonpolar ends of those membranes. Part C uh, said, make a claim about the most immediate effect. So a claim is just what do you think is going to happen? to the B cancer cells if the fused cells are transferred to something that lacks nitrogen. Um, and the answer here that they were looking for is that it would they would die. And or you could say they're unable to make DNA, RNA, nucleic acids, or amino acids and proteins and so on. Um, if you said any combination of those things, you got it correct correct. You earned a point if you said they would die, you earned a point if they said they couldn't synthesize those things. Um, this is just a little too generic of an answer. They will begin to eat themselves. That's not exactly right. I don't think that's well predicted by this. Um, they'll be unable to reproduce or grow. Well, that's true. Um, but more specifically, without a source of nitrogen, life cannot continue. They would die. Um, the second part, provide reasoning. Some of you, when you wrote your answer to C, you just went ahead and made your claim and then you gave your reasoning. And if you did that, I tried to give you points for them in both places. Actually, the AP board would have if you had put them in both places. But it's important to notice the difference between making a claim and providing reasoning. A claim is just a statement, here's what I believe will happen next. Reasoning is why that thing will happen next. So if you said, if you chose the correct or wrote the correct answer here, they're going to die. In D, you needed to explain what would lead to their death, right? And the 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 way you would score this point is you would um, note that um, <coughs> nucleic acids and amino acids contain nitrogen. And with so without a source of nitrogen, you cannot make nucleic acids, which means you cannot make DNA or RNA. If without amino acids, you cannot make polypeptides and proteins. Um, so you just need to, this was really just testing. Do you know where nitrogen is found and do you know what it means if you're missing it? Okay, second question. We had this structure uh, and they suggest, they removed in A, they removed, um, it was, a, it was a receptor and they changed these two amino acids through a mutation to these two amino acids. Okay. Uh, they ask what process forms the covalent bonds. Now this student wrote dehydration synthesis, which is the right answer, but the top of all of these questions say, read each question carefully, write your response in the space below. Answers must be written out in paragraph form. Outlines, bullet lists, or diagrams are not accepted and will not be scored. This would score no points on the AP test, even though it's correct. It's a little harsh. Um, it's not something I like about AP scoring, but it's the truth. If they, if this student had just wrote, written um, the process is dehydration synthesis, they would have scored the point because it's a sentence. Um, so uh the next one so that's dehydration synthesis a few people put hydrolysis make sure you understand the distinction between the two hydrolysis lysis is to break apart dehydration synthesis is to bring together um so and they were asking when peptide bonds join amino acids well that's synthesis part b then <coughs> is to explain what would happen um uh, the change in the amino acid sequence in illustrated one caused a change in the shape of receptor X. Based on the R groups of the original and the substituted amino acids, explain why the receptor changed. So this one's testing, do you know where the R groups are up here? The R groups are all these things sticking off of these amino acids. Okay. Um, now there's an amino acid here with a H, an amino acid here with a CH, and then these... There's a amino acid here with this. There's an amino acid here with this, with this, and so on. So we look at the change. Well, what changed? This one changed into this more branching structure here, as well as this one changed into this simpler form. So it's asking, um, based on the R group change, why would it change shape, right? Explain why. 
And some of you gave a generic answer. Because they're different R groups, they'll interact differently, so you will get a different shape. And what they were looking for is a more specific explanation. Um, in this case, this student said one of the amino acids changed that had a negatively charged polar group, which would have caused that amino acid to fold and be drawn to an amino acid with a positively charged R group. I would have liked to have seen that they expanded that and said the new R groups of the new amino acids had no charges, but they did start talking about the charge on those R groups, so I gave it to them. I'm not confident they would have scored this point on an AP test, but it's close enough. Um, but what they really wanted you to look at was here. There's a ch positive charge here and a negative charge here, meaning these are hydrophilic. Water, they will be attracted to the charge on a water molecule. Uh, these two are hydrophobic because there is no charge on them. So immediately the hydrophilic and hydrophobic nature of those proteins will be completely uh, altered and it'll change the shape of the tertiary structure. So they wanted you to, to clue in on those differences, right? To earn the point for that one. That was a tough one. A lot of you didn't earn that point. Um, this one, what would happen if you changed um, uh, the, uh, or what would happen as a result of the altered amino acid substitutions? You would get a structure change at all levels. They needed to see to earn a one that you indicated that the primary structure would change and the tertiary structure. You could have indicated the others because they would have changed too, but they needed to see those two. Why? Well, because when you change an amino acid, that changes the primary structure. When you change the charge on the R group, that will change the tertiary structure folding. The secondary structure may change, like it may coil a little differently, but it might not. Um, so um, actually, it's, it's likely that it wouldn't. The quaternary structure would change because the stru tertiary structure was different. Um, so anyway. But you didn't get points off if you said secondary. You just, you needed to say primary and tertiary. And then the final one, explain how the amino acid substitution shown in one is most likely to affect the function of receptor X. They were looking for a simple answer here. A lot of you went with that um, structure equals function, which is good. I like that. I probably would have taken that if I was grading it. However, to earn the point here, you needed to talk about how the shape which comes from the sequence of the amino acids, creates the function of the protein. The uh, protein functions because of its shape, which is sort of like saying it's structure, right? Um, but for proteins, we use a little bit more individualized language. Like when we're talking about carbohydrates or lipids, we talk about um, structure determines function. But when we're talking about proteins, it's, it's usually the shape of the structure that determines its function. Okay, um, so um, I hope that's helpful. Um, and if it is, I'd love some feedback so that I know this is worth my time to do this. Um, but um, yeah, let me know if you have questions.